Okay, so uh, good morning everyone. Um, so I'm here to present uh, this um, idea of doing a spectroscopic explorer with the Schmidt uh, at a car. Um, in, in this sense to put new instruments in car for, for the next generation. So the idea is to take, uh, so here you can see the Schmidt telescope uh, on the right, the dome and, and the sides. And the idea is to transform the Schmidt into a multi-object spectrograph facility. To, to simultaneously map about 2,000, say, uh, fibers to a medium resolution of about 2,500. And this would be a unique facility in the world to map bright objects nearby that are quite big. So the case team has uh, uh, currently quite a lot of members because it's, um, it's a project that exists in the air for quite long now. Uh, I mean, since uh, two mass was, was flown uh, to get spectroscopic follow-up. And so here on the left, you can see the people involved that provided me with information for, for this talk. And on the right, uh, many institutions and companies already involved to, to do preliminary design of uh, the eventual instrument. And note that there is a, um, a, our co Australian collaborators that are doing a very similar project, but in the south at AAO. So a timeline for, the, for this project uh, would be the following. We had a, a kickoff workshop uh, last February uh, here in Granada. And we are writing now the science requirement document. So how science maps onto the instrumentation to make sure you can uh, do your science. Um, the second part is more the instrumental part. So we would need to upgrade the focal plane of the, the Schmidt telescope. It could take about three years. Uh, so the focal plate is curved with a very large uh, 4.8 meter radius. And very interestingly, it has an eight degree uh, field of view. So it's a huge field of view on a plate of about 30 centimeter. So instead of having uh, the photographic plates or the say uh, camera, uh, we could put uh, a plate with robotic uh, fiber positioners to acquire spectra uh, of bright objects. So the idea is to have two sets of 450 fibers. So fiber that you can uh, position with, and in the center an IFU of, of fibers of about two, arc, two arc minutes uh, on the sides. Uh, there is some discussions ongoing where, whether we have a, a, an interchangeable slit or if we just put one slit and always map all the fibers, uh, depending on the size of the CCD to end. And then this, this feeds a dual spectrograph with two arm, say an SDSS-like spectrograph with slightly higher resolution uh, from the blue up to the infrared. Um, the idea once this upgrade is done would be to do three types of surveys, an extragalactic survey named Lorca, uh, M33 3D uh, IFU survey, and a spectroscopic follow-up of Gaia stars all at the same time, because they are not on the same positions of the sky, so they are very complementary to use the full time of the telescope. And even with that, we could remain uh, about 20% of uh, open community time for, say, neat projects we didn't think about. So in a nutshell, what, what's new and why should we do this? From the instrument point of view, we have a huge field of view that's typical from the Schmidt telescope, and that doesn't exist anywhere, anywhere else. Uh, we'd have a large fiber multiplex, it would be reaching about a thousand, whereas this, the Australian one has only a thousand fi uh, hundred fibers, sorry. And one very unique thing that di differentiates that from SDSS is the six arc second fibers. So when you map a galaxy at 0.1, for three quarters of those galaxies, you'll get the light within, until the half light radius. So the light is a, is a fair sample of what is emitted by the galaxy. So you, you can do galaxy evolution and cosmology at the same time with the same instrument, which this doesn't exist. And the central IFU of 2.8 arc minute would be a little bit bigger than Muse, which is uh, not many people as well. From the science point of view, you could get a map between 15 and 100 times more precise for all the redshifts in the local universe. So in three years, you do all the galaxies up to redshift 0 0.15, 0 0.2, with, uh, say, a K magnitude brighter than 14, and you do it 100 times more precise than what we have today. So that enables breakthroughs in whatever topology of our, what our rest frame is 
uh, the stellar mass function clusters from LinkedIn, and so on. So it's a, it's a unique and ultimate facility for all the local universe. So I'll go through the three types of survey to motiv motivate a bit the science, and then I have a part on the, the preliminary design of the instrument. So LORCA is a, so the low redshift survey at Cala Alto. So there is a paper about it uh, in archive. So just, just to give you an idea, we've, we've done full sky maps up, up until now. So the latest ones are pl the Planck map, the CMB map at redshift 1000. And here below you have the two mass map at redshift 0 0.1. Uh, and the aim is to improve this map all the points here give you redshift to a precision of about 10% is to get it to a one per mil. And we would do the north, and Taipan in Australia would do the south. So we'd have the, say, a definitive map of the local universe. So how do we do that? So we basically take two mass, look at every detection in two mass, and we use the Gaia catalog. So the Gaia catalog will tell us where are the stars, and the two mass catalog where when it's not a star from Gaia, then it's a galaxy, and we just wire galaxies and stars according to where we point, because if we point extragalactic, then they will be dominated by galaxies, and the closer we get to the galactic plane, then we'll, we'll do more stars. And so the target selection, so to say, is so quite easy. Uh, so combining two mass with uh, WISE. So WISE was reactivated into NeoWISE, so it, it gets really deep now. And it really, really have to understand what you're looking at. And it's very complementary to all the extragalactic survey like EBOS, FORMOST, and DAISY, because these surveys have very tiny fibers, and they have bigger telescopes with smaller field of view, so they, they, they intrinsically, they look at higher redshift. But then they depend on us to have the rest frame. You, you need an H naught calibration at some point. Another interesting thing is it has different systematics and degeneracy is compared to cepheids and supernova. Because in the local universe, we have a lot of supernovae, we have a lot of cepheids, but looking at BAO gives you a different degeneracy in your cosmological parameters. So that's just the current map about a third of it has information which is not at the level of what Lorca would provide. It, so where we already have information, Lorca would give you a factor of five to 10 better, and where we don't, then it's a factor of, say, of 100 compared to the photometric project. So just, we, so in this paper, we made a simulation of observed universes. So we simulated a thousand observed universes with a, with a uh, Zeldovich approximation. So we get this redshift distribution that peaks at redshift 0 0.1. So with everything below 0 0.07, you can map and the redshift and the peculiar velocity. So you can look at the 4D map uh, of the local universe. And above 0 0.07, the uncertainty becomes too large, so you just map the redshift. And so with the higher redshift part, you can look at the two-point correlation function and measure the BEO feature in the two-point correlation function. So this bump here in, in this uh, extra probability to have pairs of galaxies at about 100 megaparsec is a standard ruler. So it acts like a supernova and gives you a, a standard value of what a meter is at this redshift. And so with these simulations, we can quantify the expected error of this measurement, which is with the full sky, so combining the south and the north of 1%, and uh, with half the sky is about 4%. So what are the requirements to do this mapping? So you need to measure about 200,000 uh, redshift uh, with an error on the redshift of one per minute. <coughs> to do this, you need a, a nice uh, wavelength coverage. And the most important is the 4,000 extra break uh, for these uh, passively evolving galaxies. Uh, with the Schmidt telescope, it corresponds to a three hour exposure. So we used SDSS spectra um, to quantify this. And if we use 100 micron fibers, which is six arc seconds of the sky, um, we get most of the light of the galaxies and we can also do uh, galaxy evolution with that to understand our selection function even better. So the second case is to look at M33 and map it in 3D with the IFU. 
So here is M33. Um, and every red square is the two half minute uh, IFU. So with five to eight dark second uh, fibers in the IFU, you would map scales of 20 to 30 kilo, uh, parsec uh, within the galaxy. So you'd get a very detailed map of the full galaxy, and <coughs> thanks to the big field of view, then you don't need 10 years to map it. And, and actually, in, in three years, you can, you can have a complete map uh, of M33. So there was a simulation done uh, uh, using uh, the Khalifa pipeline uh, that shows that we, we really understand what would come out of this IFU and that we could easily handle this data because, I mean, compared to Khalifa, compared to Muse, it would be a small uh, data set, so to say. And so here you just recovered uh, the velocity, the curve of the, the profile of the velocity. And so the last case is the follow-up of uh, one million bright stars. So using Gaia, you have about one million stars uh, brighter than 12. And you have uh, exquisite astrometry for that. So, but whatever, because we have six axons and fibers. And so we could actually map all of them. And if we have a, spec a spectrograph of 3,000 resolution, then we have good atmospheric parameters for all of these stars in the north. So then we're done, right? So it would really help for the connection between uh, the stars and all the observations that were done uh, at fainter magnitude by all these telescopes. So these telescopes never really look at bright stars in a systematic way over a huge footprint. So if we do uh, 2,600 visits of 30 minutes in three years, then we map 1 million stars on 20,000 uh, square degrees. And in the south, it's not the Taipan project, but it's the Funnel Web project that does this um, thing. So in the end, combining Funnel Web and uh, forms, then you'd have uh, an exhaustive uh, bright star survey. Now I want to go a little bit more into the instrument because that's, uh, I guess, the, what's more interesting in, in this workshop. So these numbers were computed by uh, Justo Sanchez, by Brian Murray, and, and Francisco Prada. It's a very preliminary design. So we have the Schmidt telescope. It's an 80 diameter lens uh, that guarantees transmission from 300 nanometer to 1500 nanometers, so which is much wider than what we would like to map in the spectrograph, so it's fine. Then we have a, 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 a concave mirror of 1.2 meter, uh, and we have a focal plate with curvature radius of um, 4.8 meter. The focal length is about 2.5 meter, and the scale ratio one third, and the scale is 86 arc second per millimeter. So if you have a 100 micron fiber, it's eight arc seconds. And then there are two auxiliary guiding cameras that can give you a precision of 0.56 arc second, which is good enough because it's a tenth of six arc second for our fiber positions. So that, that wouldn't need an upgrade. So here is from inside, so here you see the telescope tilted and you see uh, Rusto and Mark in the telescope uh, looking at the, what now holds, say, photographic plates and here you have the two uh, guiding cameras so the idea would be, so you have here the, the spider uh, with the focal plane. The idea would be to, to remove that and replace it with a, with, a new, uh, with a new design. And there are, well, there could be different ways to do it. Is you, you could uh, here unscrew the, the mirror or you could maybe take off the top of the lens. That I already don't know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> so the focal plate. So what do we put in the focal plates? We put fiber positioner and an uh, IFU. And we need a camera to map it because you need to know where your fibers are pointing. It's, uh, it's not obvious. So here in, in this table, you have a comparison of uh, three instruments, Psi, uh, BBOS, and BESI, for uh, a fixed uh, plate uh, size, right? So 240. Millimeter. So knowing that the Schmidt is, is, is larger, it's a 330. 
and you have here the number of actuators of the fiber robots you can pack uh, in an hexagonal packaging. So here they had uh, 82 in, in Big Boss and Desi, they have between 400 and 600. And here, because actually it, we don't need to pack it so tightly, uh, we relax that constraint to about 300, 330. So if you take the full focal plate, it gives you about 500 uh, actuators. So this, to reach this number, it's, it's easier than what actually is done on other telescopes because they have a, a, a smaller field of view, they need to pack things. And that's so a first, uh, a first concept designed by uh, Mark Dobaldam in Durham. <coughs> so you see here the, the spiders, you have the, the actuators for the tip and the focus. And then you have a, a focal plate with a, a, a honeycomb um, hexagonal packaging where you have the actuators coming off here. And here in the middle, you will have uh, the central of IFU. The magenta uh, camera would come up and down to map the fibers uh, between every exposure. So it, such a design would not be great if you'd have to move your actuators every 10 minutes but we only move it every three hours. So it's not a big deal. If you, want, if you would do that for DESI, every 10 minutes you're moving fibers and all, that doesn't work. But here, every three hours, so three times per night, you have some overheads due to your fiber magnet. So it's, it's viable. And here is the prototype uh, designed by AVS of the fiber robots. So, the, say the challenge in, 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 in this design was to make the actuators quite short because you don't have uh, that much depth inside the tube to put from the actuators to the fibers and then uh, to come out. So, well, that's good. So here you would have the actuators pointing like this and here you see the buffer so if your actuators are like 10 centimeters high, it's called like that, and then you have your fibers, you cannot, you cannot bend the fibers in the very small radius. Huh? If you try that home with your, uh, with your free box, then if you bend it, then you don't have internet anymore. Uh, so it's the same thing, you cannot bend it to a very small radius. So it, it goes then out. So then the question of how it comes out is, is also not that simple, but there are solutions, is to make it come out of the side and then have fibers running on the floor and with a lot of slack so that when you move the telescope, the fibers can move around and, and, and it's fine. So I'll move to my uh, last slide, which is uh, we made a tentative budget for our first slide in 2019 if, when it were to happen. So the mechanical structure, the spider, the plate, we've got uh, 120K, 450 robotic positioners, 500K, about thousand, it's about a thousand euro for five per robotic positioner. Then the fiber system and pseudo slit is a bit less than 100k. The spectrograph is quite expensive. Well, it's a spectrograph, but it's teams. There are many spare spectrographs around here. <laughs> uh, then a you know, cryostat with a 4k by 4k um, guiding camera. Well, so all together, it comes to for the first three years. So the three years of, say, upgrading of the full plate plus first three years of operations, uh, counting 300 euros per night um, for operations would give like a 2 million euro um, sort of project. Knowing that, I mean, after that, you can still use this as a community instrument for probably another five or six years too. So, yep, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So, well, I mean, that's a good question. The only thing we thought about was the curvature. So we would put the fibers at different heights, yeah. depending on the position. But if you say we have to tilt them, then fine, we just drill holes like this. And if it's not too big, right? <laughs> I, guess, I guess we could, you know, tilt some, according to their position. Mm -hmm. 
clarify for one week. Do you only need uh, 4K, 4K CCD? Only one? Yeah, so uh, 1,000 fibers max on that. We could use 2K by 2K if we had a dual sit and then choose with which 500 we max on the system. But you mentioned that you have to do um, spectrograph. So good, good. Ah, good, good. Well, you could have like a muse like spectrograph with one arm. Resolution 3000, uh, but 3000, and then you have a 4K CCD to map this resolution. Then, if you have 2K by 2Ks in dual slit, then that's a two arm spectrograph. Exactly like it, yes. Okay. When dual slit, actually, the aperture will be for the task. Sorry. The effective aperture for the task. I mean, because I, I guess that the plane of actuator um, will shadow the main mirror. So, do you know what is the effective aperture for the telescope? So, it's, uh, it's blocking one tenth. Yeah, one tenth. One tenth, yes. Uh, I don't have the number. I, I don't, yeah, it's just one tenth you block off in the middle. Okay, it's time to speak again. Sí, no, lo que pasa es que puede estar en modo suspensión. Algunas veces casi se ha la suspensión. Entonces puse primero el este y luego el otro. Vale, lo dejo. Ok, thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give a quick summary of the status of the instrument. And since I think you are thinking about building a new instrument, although there are many people in the audience that have done several already, but I think it was appropriate to give some lessons learned, so there will be also some technical and managerial lessons to be learned, so try to avoid I mean, falling over twice because of the same stone. Sometimes that doesn't happen, it can get worse. Some people even have to try six or seven times until they realize. And of course, it can get even worse. You eventually can get uh, familiar with the stone that actually made, the, made you fail. It actually happens to me a bit. Okay, so the Megara is, the, is, in my opinion, is a unique instrument that is filling a niche that right now is not yet uh, filled. And it's a, within the GTC instrumentation uh, plan, it's covering this gap in the optical range, basically the entire optical range all the way to one micron and resolutions <coughs> between 5,000 to 20,000. And with a specific characteristic which I think makes it unique, which is the fact that it's very really high throughput. Right? So the efficiency is extremely high, not because only the telescope, but the instrument itself, especially working at these resolutions as, as high as 20,000. So this is how DTC looks like. You know, it's a 10.4 meter. It's the largest optical telescope monolithic, well, mm -hmm. not monolithic, but uh, you know, single mirror telescope. And that's how Megara will be located. That's the default the scars F unit, and then the light is driven by optical fibers, 40 meters in length, all the way to the spectrum. And those are already the hardware pictures of the instrument ready for a laboratory acceptance in the beginning of next year and to deliver the instrument in March of 2017. Okay, so just to, as I said, I want to give you some lessons learned. Okay. Well, I think, as I said at the beginning, everyone has to learn his own lessons or her own lessons, but I will try to give you mine might be useful, maybe not. Okay, that's the calendar that we have for the instrument. So we passed the PDR in 2012. Actually, we had a conceptual design in 2010. And then we have a CDR in 2014. 
keep in mind that we didn't receive the funds for detailed design or construction, which are the majority of the funds, until 2014, so two years ago. So that has been a, quite of a race, that's why the name of the talk. And, and soon we'll have the, the laboratory acceptance in February, the delivery in March, uh, hopefully the, the fully commissioned in the summer. Uh, the instrument is built by a consortium of institutions that is led by the Universidad Complutense in Madrid, with the representative in Jesús Gallego, the Inaue in Mexico, one of the Conacyt centers with uh, Esperanza Carrasco, is building this effort, the IIA here in, in Granada, and is uh, led by Jesús Jorge Iglesias, and the UPM Politécnica led by Raquel Cedaz. Okay, so first slide with uh, defenseless situation, which is my first lesson. So. <laughs> Well, in the case of Megara, we had a, a big problem with the cash at the beginning because basically when we had no major cash until the uh, detailed design, which is in May 2014, so two years and a bit ago. So we have, uh, besides not only that, but in, in the meantime, because it was on the peak of the crisis, we had these small contracts that were chopped and usually they were associated with extra milestones that were actually imposed by the observatory. So we had to do a alternatives for the spectrograph milestone, an optics PDR, then of course the regular PDR, a delta PDR, uh, we had to suffer, although we actually came out very well from the new DTC instrumentation plan in the middle of the development, it was a stop, okay, we have to do a new instrumentation plan, you are just waiting in the garage and I let you know. So that was another few months. And then we had an optics CDR before the regular CDR. So that was basically, caused by the fact that there was no funds, no major funds, and we just got delayed just by imposing us additional milestones. Then, of course, that led to delays in the project, and the delays automatically to overcost, because you cannot fire everyone and then hire them again and hope that everything works as perfect and you can just keep doing your instrument the, the day after. It doesn't work that way. You have a company that actually has its own commitments and change to a different project, and you might lose them forever. Or, or critical personnel, for example. Mm -hmm. So that led to overcost, of course, that at that time they were charged on our warranty time. Second lesson, don't let them do that. Fight with your teeth if necessary. But we had to do it because basically we were in a defense in the situation. Last minute surprises, that might happen also. The last minute just because of the feather funds. We all depend on feather funds, unfortunately. And here in, in the Canary Islands and also in Andalusia, but in many other regions, so sometimes you have to depend on different feather periods and you have to split your contract from one day to the next one just because they belong to different feather uh, periods. You cannot have a contract with a single feather period. Okay, keep it in mind. And then there is also, it's also very important to have powerful supporters in every level of the decision tree, all the way from Mariano Rajoy to your <laughs> department director. Well, not Mariano Rajoy, you only need somebody at the, uh, at the Congress. That will, I think that will work. Okay, now that's keeping with the telescope observatory side, the friendly situation that might happen to any other instrument. Hopefully not, but okay, well, that's the way it is. So the observatory should certainly have a long-term plan before you start building your instrument. It's not that they are on the process because Priorities might change and you get stuck in the process or you might get not funded in the process. The funding should be secure, but that's a general problem in Spain. So we cannot commit anything beyond four years, even one year in some cases. So that's a problem for the observatory, but also, of course, for the, somebody working for an instrument for that particular observatory in Spain. Lack of transparency, that's also a problem. The team should certainly know what is the status of the focus where the instrument is going, or the telescope, or the calibration module, what is the <coughs> funding profile of your project and of the observatory itself, etc., etc. I can keep going for <laughs> a long time. And then certainly it's key to success to have a devote project manager, that's critical, now we have Marisa from FACTA, that is doing an awesome job. A committed consortium companies, because sometimes they have to suffer also the lack of funding for sometimes shouldn't happen, but it does happen. So that's something to keep in mind. And of course, a sign thing that can complain at due time and support at due time, which happens too, of course. And many of you know perfectly what I mean. 
uh, and then of course you need a clear and unique scientific and instrumental niche because even if your science is unique and you have another instrument nearby even in the US and Japan is doing the same thing we are not particularly fast in Spain for doing these things so it's better that you keep your instrumental needs well in advance so in a way that even if it lasts another two years you're still the first one okay on the institutional side that's I mean, this case is Complutense University, but it happens certainly in the FESIC and in many other universities in Spain. So we have the Ley de Contrato del Sector Público. I'm not going to translate that. <laughs> there are exceptions to the, how that, that law is applied. In particular, when there are public competitions, there are exceptions to that. So read it carefully, and you may get an exception that will speed up your call for tenders or your well, any, any purchase or any uh, some contraction, some, some, yeah, some contract that you want to, to, to make. Also, read the Ley de la Ciencia, Tecnología y la Innovación because it has important details. For example, now universities and CSIC and OPIS are exactly the same for the Ley de Contrato del Sector Público. You should read that too. It's a pain, but I know. And then, of course, you have to fight for doing the call for tenders as sort of possible, just keep calling, what about my staff, what about my staff, I will go there, no, 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 yeah, yeah, I will go there. No, you know how it works. And it's important to have key administration, uh, administrative personnel, ah, sorry, <laughs> yeah, as I said. So sometimes even if you have to fight against the director of the SIC or president of the SIC or vice president or whatever, don't worry, they last less than your project. So eventually there will be another one that will arrive and will tell you, it's working. You know why it has been working so bad? Because the, your predecessor was awful. Yeah, I know. I was, I was so sometimes, don't worry about that because they, they eventually leave. Except some. <laughs> In general, most of them leave. So, I mean, the, the, the point here is that you have to fight. Because even if some people get, may get upset, it's your project, it's your responsibility. So even if you step on some toes, well, it's worth, it's worth it, I guess. Okay, and then I think also it's important in terms of bureaucracy and fighting with all the paperwork to have a dedicated project controller that actually is uh, devoted day by day and also have the low level administration on your side. That's very important because the top level administration, well, sometimes they don't know where they're signing, but the person that is in charge of your project, she or he should be really happy with you. Okay, and if there are doubts, always fine. Okay, so just to highlight the, our gaps, those are in red, the time that we didn't have funds, and that's when we started to have funds. So before CDR, which was here, 2014, 65% of the time we were without funds, because there is also time of the So that caused delays, and we eventually paid with 300 hours of the warranty time. That's how it is. Okay, let's, after this first rough guide lesson, I don't know if the streaming is also taping. Uh, there's there's it, but okay, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the people that actually build the instrument. These are the instrument team. These people from the Complutense, in a way, IIA, CSIC, and also the Polytechnic University that was in the pre-laboratory acceptance. We also have a pre-laboratory acceptance milestone. Although, well, that wasn't that bad. It was part of the, of the original content. Okay, that's the science team. Most people are from, from Spain, but not, not only from consortium institution, from institutions in the consortium, but also elsewhere, like the AEC, CMAT, uh, CAP, etc. And also people, of course, from Mexico, not only in Hawaii, but also UNAM, and from University of Florida, which is the other, until now, GTC partner. Okay, what is the science that is driving us? Well, we actually, we have such a large team and we are building a facility instrument, so we want to make the instrument something useful for everyone in the GTC community, Spain, Mexico, and Florida. So we are basically have audit audits that go all the way from the study of stellar clusters in the Galactic Anticenter, the Perseus R, for example, the study especially of the low mass uh, systems, the uh, brown dwarfs and uh, basically brown dwarfs and low mass stars in general. Also the study of the local group systems uh, resolves their populations in 33 to study the, as I said later, the velocity ellipsoid and also the velocity <coughs> gradients and age gradients of the stars in 33 the study of nearby galaxies, metallicity gradients, and also the stellar population gradients. The study of proto-high receive clusters, and receive round one or so, or even higher, and then in the most in the highest resin regime, also the study of the uh, UV resonant lines emission that are resisted to the optical 
and then you can actually trace the cosmic wave by observing this this emission, which is also one of the main objectives of MUSE, of the Keck <coughs> cosmic wave imager, and so on. I'm just going to mention one, which is the one I'm mostly interested in, which is to study basically the balance between in situ and ex situ processes that led to the formation of stars in, in galaxies. So how the local formation of a star competes with ex situ processes, satellite accretion, migration within the disk of galaxies, etc. So that we are going to do that with in, in two ways. One, to study the star content of a very well positioned galaxy, which is L33, has the right inclination for deriving the velocity ellipsoid. So we'll have this kinematical component, particular of the components of the velocity ellipsoid, and also to study the profiles in metallicity of the stars and the gas, and also the stellar population property gradients in this uh, disk. And then study a larger sample of galaxies from the S4G survey to uh, basically do this in the unresolved stellar populations and also in the ionized gas through the observation of H2 regions, in individual H2 regions in the outer disk of this sample of galaxies. So I don't have much time to go into the detail, but certainly this science case and all the others I mentioned put together a series of science requirements. In particular, we certainly need an integral field unit to study not only, of course, nearby galaxies, but also planetary nebula H2 regions, and even the cosmic web is based on the IFU capabilities of the instrument, and multi-object spectroscopic capabilities for the study of resolved stellar populations in our galaxy, the local group, and also high objects which are basically point sources, so they become targets for our MOS. <coughs> and then in terms of spectral resolution, we had two requirements. Where one was the intermediate to high spectral resolution, not high at the level of a planet hunter, but resolution between 10 to 20,000, especially for a study of stars, and also for the, 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 the kinematics of a phase-on disk, which have intrinsic velocity, this velocity dispersion of only 10 kilometers per second. And then the uh, intermediate spectral resolution for a broader wavelength coverage for the study of stellar populations in unresolved stellar population in galaxies, ionized diagnostics, and so on. So that's the Megara fact sheet. We have a naive view of 12 by 12, roughly square seconds. We are in a F17 telescope. Uh, the MOS is 100 uh, units of mini IFUs of seven fibers, which are located in a in what it is the, the flat and unlimited uh, focal plane of the folded cast F of GTC. So the, this is the area covered by the MOS, by the, all the robotic positioners. The, our well end rates, the entire optical resolution, as I said, between around 6,000 to almost 20,000. It's actually 20,000 because we are better than the image quality requirement. The number of spectra is around 600 per mo, so more than 1,200 in total. And we are at the folded cast F, that's where this, the light is collected, and we move it all the way to the NASMIF A platform. Okay, that's the, just to show some subsystems, the way they are now. This is the folded cast adapter. All the robotic positioners are placed inside. Well, not yet motor here, but is where they are located. Also the IFU. That's the focal plane cover, which I will show you what is the purpose of that cover. That's the, as I said, the, the focal, the fiber MOS system plus the IFU. And here you can see sun, a fraction of the robotic positioners, something like, I think, close to 20 in this picture. And that's the ones we are integrating previously. We have 100 of those. This is the IFU. Here is without the microlens array, and here is with the microlens array. So as I said, 623 fibers, and uh, that, well, the microlens array goes from F17 to F3, which is what we need to have at the entrance of the fibers. There's some details of the mechanical manufacturing. This is all done by ABS. So these are 170 micron holes, which are, was, I think, something like two millimeters in depth. So it's pretty uh, challenging, yeah, two millimeters in depth, right? And that's the microlens array, that, which is done by Amos in Germany. Uh, an image of the robotic positioners. This is the, the, the unit we are using. This is the mechanical frame where are all located. We have a telecentric lens at the beginning, so we don't have telecentric issues in this case. And that's a picture of the, how the robotic positions are configured. This is a speed up by a factor of four, so that means that it takes about one minute in total to reconfigure the focal plane. This is just a, a subset of those. 
So of course there is a, a lot of software involved here, both in moving the position and also avoiding the collisions, uh, which is done by the way here at the IAA. And this is the, the one of the fire bundles. This is the, the the eye view, as you can see, and this is the fire bundle on the other side, at 40 meters of fiber going around here, and that's this one of the shooters lead at the entrance of the collimator of the instrument. Another lessons to be learned. In system engineering can be boring, but it's fundamental, especially when you have high multiplexing. So of course it's nice to do it without with our system engineer at the beginning, but eventually it can be a nightmare. So you don't keep track of where are all these fibers are. What, how are they connected between the focal plane and the pseudo slip? You are killed. So this is how we identify the, identify the figures in the, in the focal plane of the eye view, and that's the identification of the uh, fiber most robotic positioners and the fibers within, within each of the eye views, of the mini eye views of each robotic position. Why do we do that? Well, uh, that's the other part, that's how they are identified on the pseudo slip frame, we have a cure pseudo slip, so we have to split the, the pseudo slip in boxes and basically also separate the fibers in groups of seven to populate each of the boxes. And this is all mounted on the, on the, on the entrance of the collimator. Why do we do that? Well, first, because it's, if we don't do it, it would be a nightmare. But the second one is because we have a, a mode of a seven wind megara that allows you to reduce the crosstalk of fibers on the detector basically to noon. So the idea is that we, this is it's not a direct view, but it's more or less the way we did. it will look in the, it does look on the row to the image, that's a part of it, that will be all the fibers, one fiber, two fiber, three fiber, four fiber, six, seven, seven fibers. And we arrange the fibers in the focal plane in a way that they are interlaced on the silver slip. So when we cover half of the field, except for the central row, which the light tones are still affecting, but it's for these fibers, we have half of the focal, half of the field of view with basically, basically no crosstalk. So you have a strong demand on crosstalk, because you have a high contrast of brightness in your source, then you, you reduce the field of view, but basically you have no crosstalk at all. So that's why it's important to know where they are in the, in the focal plane <coughs> and on the surface meter. Another, another lesson that we learned is, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure Martin knows that from many years ago, but for me it was a, an, quite a, an experience, is that fibers are hard to handle, hard to glue, hard to put into requirements. So we basically had to design from scratch an entire system to illuminate the fibers, <laughs> to be sure that we glue the fibers properly, to be sure the robotic positioners are within the tilt requirement, dynamical tilt requirement, so we don't lose the secondary. So it took a while. So this is just uh, three slides showing how things are made. This is, is a summary. So we just uh, illuminate the pseudo lead on one side. That would be the first image. So we illuminate the pseudo lead. We actually have a linear state that allows us to illuminate a given set of fibers, a group of them, not of course not one by one because they are the core of the fiber is 100 microns. So would be but, but certainly a, a fraction of them. Then we move the light to the other side when we actually make an image through the other string, which is where the micro lens button is placed, which you can see here. So the, the light comes out from the fibers and then we have the button and we have to glue them together. So we actually, in real time, we see how the light comes out, in this case from the LCD, comes out from the fiber, we maximize that and then we glue with UV light, with, I mean, yeah, with UV light, UV glue. So that took, of course, uh, quite a while. And if you plan to do an instrument with fibers, certainly the background of using fibers is not uh, known. So you certainly have a, quite a learning curve there, which I will encourage to start climbing as soon as possible. Well, another good thing that we learned is that you can do a good uh, use of your hardware if you optimize, in particular, if you match the properties of your button glue to your fibers and the robotic positioner. That's a very technical detail, but so in principle it's possible to, depending on what kind of, what is the tilt that you end up with your robotic positioner, to choose the best micro lens button to, obt to obtain the best total tilt, right? 
right? Because you have a superposition of many axes. You have the, the optical axis, then you have the, the first rotation of the robotic positioner, then you have a second rotation of the arm of the robotic positioner, then you have your bottom with your fibers inside that, and then you have the micro lens glue at the top. So all that combination of angles, you can optimize in a way that even if some robotic positioner did end up the best way possible, if you find the right couple, you can actually improve a lot the, the total requirement and get as much light from the secondary as possible. OK, let's see how the hardware looks. This is the, uh, the optical design, the, the optical design of the, uh, of the spectrograph. That's the collimator. This is where the view field. This is the one of the low, well, 6,000 resolution BPAs, and that's the camera. It's a F3 collimator, F1.5 camera, which is well, quite, a, quite a nice camera, actually and three pixel in quality, as you will see la later. And uh, so that means that our 12 centimeter pseudo slit becomes six centimeters on the detector. That's why we use this 4K by 4K uh, CCD by E2B, we will see later. That's our only aspheric lens of the system. And if you have an aspheric also, that let's say, is a high risk component of your design. Because not everyone is able to do a spheric, especially with this level of a spheric. That's the last lens. You can see the, the pseudo slit all the way to, through the collimator. That's a, an image of the collimator already at the lab, ready for being integrated with the, with the instrument. And uh, this is the first lens without the cover of the, of the collimator. And that's our shutter, which is a rotary shutter. I don't have time to go into the detail, but it's an interesting way of saving money. When you're setting the red, you usually have to put order sorter filters. If you have many BPAs like we do, you, in principle, you should put your order sorter on top of each of the BPAs, and those are like this big, the BPAs, so you don't want to do that, and you have five of those, so it will be really expensive. So you will have a, totally have a sorter that rotates. It has two positions, or well, three, open, close, and open with filter. It's an hexagon shape thing. Right? So that way we actually have a tiny filter from Gideon, extremely good actually, that with only one filter we cover all the possible cases of red BPAs that could have some contamination from second order. That's the camera design, look at the size of the, that's a doublet, Candy 4, Candy 5 doublet, that's all made at the Inaue in Mexico, and that's the, that's the camera and that's the cryostat, and that's the big piece in the middle which we friendly call El Trozo. Uh, it's interesting because sometimes when you work with, uh, in this case, with Inaue, because let's say, they are really, well, all companies and all institutions are proud of what they do, but they specifically proud of their, of their uh, coatings, right? In particular, the collaboration with the FIO, Centro de Investigación Exenóptica, which is another connected center, actually, was really successful. We got really extremely good coating, uh, coatings for all the lenses. So these are all the lenses in the main optics without the... BPH. So as you can see, we are basically we, we are well above in transmission the, the requirement. So typically around 1% or less uh, losses. So that the PP elements are made at the inner way. So look at the size of these prisms. They are glued here with the windows where the BPHs are embedded. So that's one of the windows, and those are the windows glued, being glued to the uh, prisms, and that's the wheel, and then so you later with the prisms inside. So what are the spectral configurations that we have? Uh, so we have all the low resolution in six shots, which is around resolution 6,000, resolution 10,000, and then two setups are resolution 20,000. Although by design principle, we could have anywhere uh, resolution 20,000. But we chose the H-alpha region, receive zero, and the calcium triple region for stellar kinematics and uh, chemical abundance and so on. Now, how does it compare? And that's going back to the niche thingy. So this is a, a, a graph that actually I think was made by Lutz uh, back in 10 years ago, probably. So I took it from him. That's the, so the different responses of the, for example, this is Muse, the white field mode. And that's flames in blue. It's written here, flames in blue, force two in red, and the Vimos IFU, few, which is something hard to distinguish from, from from force in this case. And then a shooter, which are these green lines. And our lines are this kind of 
half Gaussian thingies up and down. So that's, these are our medium resolution, the low resolution are here, 6,000 resolution, and the higher resolution are these ones. Of course, at the edges we always have lower resolution. We are covering plus minus 10 degrees from the camera to the detector. So it's, it's normal, but still we have total throughput, including everything, the mirror of the DTC, the and the efficiency of the mirror, the, on the secondary tertiary, all the main optics, the fibers, and the CCD. And we are, as I said, even higher, as high as 40% in the best case, and typically between 20 and 30% in the worst case with, for a fiber spectrograph. In general, for a spectrograph, it's extremely good. And as I, you can just have an idea that we get a five sigma point source sensitivity of in one hour of between 23 and 24 minutes, maybe. It's, and still, as I said, working at a resolution between 6,000 and 20,000. So I tried to make uh, one of these politically delicate plots with all the <laughs> capabilities of the visual <coughs> instruments. Of course, I was probably more relaxed in mind than with the rest. I should admit so. But in any case, I think one of the main important parts is that uh, Megara will provide a versatile instrument with IFU and most mode with a high efficiency, I mean, sorry, with a high intermediate to high spectral resolution, and which is particularly, uh, I say, specific, is with a very high throughput, right? And not only that, we have a 10.4 meter behind. So we certainly beat any other instrument at resolutions 20,000 for years to come, I would say. Another interesting thing that I would like to highlight is that you probably have noticed, but spect spectrographs are moving progressively in the in last few years, at least the designs that are in the market, are moving progressively to the resolution 5,000 and 20,000. So cases like that are we, for example, they have also a 5,000 and 20,000 mode. The for most for Vista, 5,000 and 20,000. And even Mosaic at DLT has this 5,000 with some modes of 20,000. Uh, so it's, a, it's not coincidence. There are spectral libraries that are coming in a resolution around 8,000, especially from next shooter. And certainly one way to improve the, inf the con information content of your target is certainly improve the spectral resolution. And now what we can do it with high throughput, we certainly, uh, we are moving in that direction. And Megara will be the first one with that range of spectral resolution, preserving the entire throughput and the entire collecting power of the telescope, GTC in this case. Mechanically speaking, this is the, where the wheel with the, our BPAs are placed on. Now this is inside the instrument already, so you can see the collimator here, the camera here, that's the pupil position, and that's the, the platforms for the BPAs, and that's already with some of the BPAs inside. So that's the low resolution, look like flat, I mean they are narrow, and then you have here, for example, this one, where is it? I think this one here, one here is medium resolution, and there is another high resolution on this side. But there will be more pictures. Control system that was all made at the Computation University, the hardware part of the control system, and it's all ready now, and working fine. And that's uh, also the important part is that, especially with you work, when you work with iFuse, also with most, but certainly with iFuse, uh, you want to make the community, uh, I mean, offer the community with a user-friendly set of tools, not only for preparing observation, also processing and things like that. So that's our commitment, and I think we are moving quite okay in that direction. That's uh, the tool that we use for uh, optimizing the observation with the MOS. So it's a simple Java tool. Doesn't take a lot of memory. It's not the Jython or anything like that. It's just simple Java. It runs pretty fast. And that's uh, how you set up the focal plane on top of your list of targets. You just assign your... Uh, this block to your targets, they are assigned based on, of course, a figure of merit, a priority, and also distance to the center, and then you save this and you have your observation configured. Now, how will that work at the telescope? So imagine that that's your field. This is actually a simulated field in the outskirts of M33. So we are interested about the, these massive blue stars in the outskirts of M33. That's our let's say our catalog of entry catalog, then we run the other tool that you saw, we assign the position of the different robotic positioners, and then the robotic positioners run a program that was also done here at AAA to determine not only, uh, I mean, 
to use those assignments to basically determine the, the order in which the, the different robotic positioning should move because, of course, they are in a hexagonally shaped pack uh, arrangement, so they are overlapping regions, and those are the ones that should be populated but without collisions. So that's something this software is doing, and that's, that's it. In 22 seconds, you have all the field configured in this case. The maximum time is around one minute. So now let's see real data. That's the interesting part. Well, hopefully everything is interesting, but when you see the, the data on the detector, that's certainly a big change. So that's one of the first images that we took. That's the low resolution C. So it goes all the way to 9,700. And that's the, the allergen lamp. So this 600, almost that 640 spectra uh, with the allergen lamp. And that's the same, the same BPH, but with the thorium argon lamp. And that's a zoom of one. So that's the whole frame. So there are two different amplifiers. We are reading in two different amplifiers to minimize the, uh, the crosstalk that is produced while reading a 23184 detector. So in two, with two amplifiers, we get much better than reading in four. And that's a zoom of 30. So you can see all the, one of the emission lines from thorium or, or argon and the different traces on the detector of some of the fibers. In terms of image quality, uh, we're actually pretty happy. This is the curve lines for every single line, for every single fiber in this frame. And as you can see, all these curves are, have a minimum that is always below the requirement, which implies a resolution around 6,500. So at the end, we are even below that. So we are typically around a resolution 7,000, but with the same uh, well in coverage, of course. Now you wonder about how we are sampling the lines. So you, this is the detector. These are some numbers that we compute for some of the lines on the detector. And those are the numbers. This is the for a focus of 2,100, which is the one that we find to be the, first, the best uh, trade-off in this plot. We have typically an image quality of around between 3 and 3.4 pixels. This is extremely good. And that's what gives us actually this 7,000 spectral resolution. Uh, just to show some spectra, because as somebody, some people say, you don't show a spectrum like this, you don't have an instrument. So that's the four of the six setups are low resolution. I just put them together artificially, let's say, I mean, scale them artificially because of course they have different exposure times, different range in intensities of the line. But the idea is that we have with all these four setups, four shots, all the way between 5,000 to 9,700. These are all the, you know, the lines. We have some overlap. We always have some overlap because, uh, well, just in case, you, we want to be sure that the uh, spectral resolution, I mean, we have the full coverage across the entire uh, optical window at low and medium resolution. And also because, as I said, the efficiencies always fall a bit on the high angles of the, of the red and blue end. So having that overlap allows you to, if you are interested about this particular line at 8,100, if you only have it uh, in this stream, probably the efficiency will be low. So you can use it in this other mode and will still be an efficiency very close to the peak efficiency of the BPH. Now, in terms of wavelength coverage, as I said, yeah, we have the, the full expected wavelength coverage. So basically, the central wavelengths are in the same place. And actually, the, spectral, the, the reciprocal dispersion is what is expected. These are just some plots showing the wavelength calibration of these four BPHs with the, the arcs that we were taking, we are typically RMS of 0.2 Armstrong, 0.001 Armstrong, 0.03 Armstrong. So basically, it's a, a three order polynomial that's a perfect job. So image quality, stability, everything runs as expected. Regarding repeatability, so for example, I want to build to take an spectrum now of my target and I want to come back tomorrow and the next day and the next day. How does it work? We know that have been some issues with some other instruments, and it could be more or less complicated to try to combine. Since we have the spectra on the NASMITH, here there is no problem. You basically have to know what worry about. For exactly in the same place. Actually, these are three exposures taken, putting the VPH in the pupil, taking it out, move, it, move the wheel, putting it back, and so on. And even when you change the focus, you can also see that the lines are in the same place. And as you see, they are exactly on the same place. As usually say when I put this, 
the they are limited by my ability to align figures in PowerPoint, not by by the repeatability of the mechanisms or, or the or the setups. Temperature, we are working fine. Uh, the suppressor actually, we are doing uh, fine the, the vacuum of the cryostat. This is a micro Pirani sensor, so we cannot go below this, but we now have another sensor and we are typically around two to three, 10 to the minus six millibar. And the temperature is also uh, pretty stable at four, one, five, 147 K more or less we are working right now. And the whole time is typically around two days, 48 hours. That's the spectrograph, already with the cover on, still playing, of course, doing the, the cabling properly, but it's almost ready. So the recent um, upcoming activities, uh, uh, we have the, the BPL was integrated in 2015, so one year after we got the money from detailed design and construction, just to give you a hint of how fast we should go and how, fa how hard we have to fight with the different agents involved. Uh, the first BP agents arrived in May 2016, and then the, the AFU and his, his fiber bundle was uh, uh, integrated in May, yeah, I mean, three days after. The collimator camera and were already integrated in, in the state, that's 2016, of course. Uh, yeah, and the science CD was then integrated roughly one month after. Once that we knew that everything was Running okay with engineering CCD, we move to the science CCD. I didn't say this at 23184, what well, I mentioned it, but it's the same as the one in Carmenes. It's because a broader wellen coverage uh, coating, of course, and it's also the same one as Muse, but with a different coating again. Um, so, as, as for the other instruments, very low flanging in the red, <coughs> pretty decent efficiency in the blue, so it's working great, good cosmetics, and by reading in two amplifiers, we are pretty happy also with the with the crosstalk between the amplifiers. And the, now we are finishing AV, AV. We are also receiving the last fiber MOS robotic positioning, which are the ones that are being delayed, and that's why we have a few couple of months delay to what it was expected originally. Laboratory acceptance in February, the delivery in March, and hopefully will be installed in April, May, June, depending on the Grand Tecan uh, schedule. In that. So, in a few months, hopefully you will enjoy this, uh, for in my opinion, first high throughput resolution 6 to 20,000 IFU and most in a 10 meter telescope. Okay? Uh, AA Omega is probably similar in some regard, although it has some cross talk issues, but it's certainly similar, but of course it's a 4 meter telescope. And it will be ready for science in, well, as soon as commission is over, and it does. I encourage you to propose for it. There will probably be a special call for proposal for as soon as the commission is finished. And that's just an image showing how the spectra was integrated. Most of us were not wearing uh, labs and suits because there were no optics uh, open. In the moment of, the, of course, we had to open the optics. Everything was clean and protected. As the collimator arriving, they will already arrive a few months ago, and now we will see the camera appearing with the cryostat attached, that's it. And now we put a temporary cover to do the test with engineering CCD, because in case we had to make an intervention, a major intervention, so that's the engineering CCD, first light with engineering CCD, everyone was so happy, we removed the temporary one and put the final cover and got ready for AV and final testing of the science CC with more and more VPAs and more and more positions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because from first principles, you have to assume that. Uh, did you use Gaussians to fit? 
Am I? Actually, it was done by Nicolas Cardiel, the fitting, and he's, I mean, he probably actually convolved the Gaussian with a box to be sure that the sampling was the same in the in the actual data that in the assumed wavelength for the line. So he is he's very meticulous, Nicolas. So I'm sure that. Uh, uh, but, but yeah, in principle, is they are Gaussian. What I know is that they are convolved for not with a box for the for the size of the pixel. When you go to this level of accuracy, what, what happens is that you have to look into the image quality as it changes over the field of view. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are experiencing this in having trouble to get the utmost accuracy to model the line fit function in use. Mm -hmm. Now, stimulated from a discussion with the PI, uh, we have conducted our second online test, a test of a laser frequency comb on Color Alto uh, with a tunable comb. Uh, for the purpose of tuning to the line fit function. And we're still working out the data, but the paper will come out shortly. Mm -hmm. I think we will get even better when we were, are able to individually, for each line, over the, the higher field of view, model a line fit function that is very different from a simple Gaussian, mm -hmm. uh, which is currently what we do most of the time. Yeah, you mean that the, yeah. Okay, so you are basically like using the the CMAX results to predict how the profile of the light yes, should be yes, as a yes. function of wavelength on position in the detector, and you use that as an input or as a prior for the for the fitting. No, Something like that. no we actually measure it. Uh, okay. Lay frequency comp can be measured as a set of delta functions, and if you have two little uh, comp, then you can go across. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you get the actual profile, and yes. you use that as a function of wavelength. Okay. okay. Salte, salte, salte de la presentación y bueno. Aquí, presiona fuente para que se me Cada vez que, que desconecta hay que no, 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 no me lo sé. 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 No me
¿Cuál era? Um, yeah, differently from uh, other talks, I think uh, uh, I will concentrate more on uh, uh, basic uh, technologies uh, that uh, could improve uh, future astronomical instrumentation rather than present uh, um, um, really a, a concept of uh, instrument or um, uh, specific plans uh, for observations. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, as, in, as in the uh, title, uh, you see that uh, the focus on the development is about uh, photonic. Uh, so uh, how photonic can actually improve the future astronomic and instrumentation. So uh, this is the idea behind so a short introduction uh, 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 about the definition <coughs> of photonics. Uh, photonics uh, could be defined as uh, an applied science that uh, uh, deals with the generation of light uh, transport and manipulation of light signals and eventually detection of light. So, and uh, first uh, there are some examples uh, uh, which uh, pertain to this uh, uh, three class of uh, topics. Um, uh, in the, the realm of generation of light, of course, uh, the first idea is uh, uh, generating light uh, through uh, a lasing uh, process. So lasers and various wavelength, uh, various capabilities uh, uh, and um, uh, performances uh, fall into this category. Uh, transport and manipulation of light signals, uh, uh, of course, transport uh, through optical uh, waveguides uh, is, uh, is uh, a typical application of uh, photonic, and improving this is a major task of uh, uh, photonic <coughs> as a science. Um, regarding manipulation of light, uh, I can mention, and I will come up uh, with this a bit later on, uh, integrated optical circuits that can perform uh, some uh, signal conditioning and, pr and uh, processing uh, um, through um, uh, using basically um, only light or uh, maybe optoelectronic uh, system in which uh, uh, some optical properties in local areas of this uh, photonic integrated chip can be uh, changed uh, with electric signal. And of course, uh, another big topic, which is uh, of extreme interest for astronomy, is uh, as well uh, development of uh, uh, detectors, uh, possibly with high quantum efficiency, low noise, and uh, extended uh, um, wavelength coverage. So, um, let's say, uh, I wanted to highlight in this slide uh, why photonic is interesting, and uh, with a hint also for interesting for astronomy. Uh, of course, uh, 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 the, the photonics study is the way of delivering a high efficiency light source and detectors um, that uh, can be developed by engineering materials really at the atomic level. And uh, um, light confinement on wavelength scale, or more recently even in the sub wavelength scale. Uh, usually result in compact and lightweight components uh, which uh, for light transport and manipulation. Well, it's also an important task if you're concerned about the weight of your instrument. And uh, finally, uh, there are a very interesting property uh, because photonics mostly exploits the weight properties of light uh, to select uh, uh, wavelength or process signal. Um, this uh, is a capability that uh, um, a simple, um, um, let's say, geometrical optic based uh, devices uh, cannot offer. Okay, so uh, there is a word to define application of uh, uh, photonics to astronomy, which uh, came up in the um, 
let's say, last a decade, uh, more or less, and it's the word is astrophotonics. So uh, this word is designed, uh, it designates uh, actually application of photonics to astronomy and astronomical instrumentation. And uh, uh, even though this uh, neologism has been uh, invented a few years ago, uh, this uh, uh, utilization of photonic uh, components uh, for astronomical instrumentation has a very long history. And uh, uh, its uh, advantage uh, for astronomy are really proven. No? Uh, because uh, um, by using these devices, you can increase productivity and or enable new science. So an example <coughs> that comes to my mind, of course, that is most of the interest of the people here gathered in this uh, uh, workshop, are, of course, uh, uh, multiple object spectroscopy and integrity for the spectroscopy, which uh, have the foundation in the late 70s and beginning of the 80s. So this is where, actually, uh, perhaps the first application <coughs> of uh, uh, waveguides uh, uh, to um, astronomical instrumentation, so fibers and this kind of things. Now, all we know that uh, this uh, uh, kind of instrument have uh, uh, multiplied uh, by order of magnitude the productivity in terms of science for most of the observatory all over the world. And uh, uh, just to remind that uh, uh, actually the Carlato uh, in uh, observatory and uh, uh, the, the <coughs> my institute for so the uh, astronomical Astrophysical Institute of Potsdam have uh, very extended experience in this field, uh, uh, which has started already in the late 90s, beginning of the 2000s with the PMAS project, and uh, uh, recently ended up uh, with uh, uh, this uh, foremost uh, um, project, uh, uh, which will be uh, uh, basically coordinated by the AP. So, uh, uh, however, uh, let's say that um, contemporary astrophotonics is not uh, only um, related to light transport uh, to fibers uh, from uh, the telescope focus to an instrument, um, but uh, mm, there is much more and uh, most of the, 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 uh, the, the new uh, um, ideas came up uh, in the last uh, 15 years, perhaps, or, um, or at least uh, even if the concept were maybe rooted uh, much early in time, uh, technology advance uh, was able to uh, give uh, way to test of sky or even instruments only in very recent years. And uh, here I, uh, I give a short, very uh, small and narrow overview about uh, what has uh, been done uh, recently and uh, has been break breakthrough for uh, certain astronomical branches. Um, on one side we have uh, photonic light sources and we all know which could be the potential advantage of laser guard stars and impact on, on science on that. Um, so uh, sodium light uh, 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 lasers that can excite uh, uh, sodium uh, resonances uh, and uh, high in, uh, in the atmosphere uh, were uh, delivered only very recently. Um, all this uh, topic about the optical frequency combined their application for uh, conversion of high resolution and low resolution spectrographs uh, is uh, still under development and uh, has reached, of course, uh, some breakthrough like uh, uh, allowing uh, uh, the calibration up to uh, the few centimeters per second level of uh, high resolution high end uh, spectrographs. Um, from the lights, uh, part, uh, from the part of uh, photonic light manipulation, I want to stress a uh, uh, very successful, um, uh, let's say, story of uh, developing integrated optical circuits for stellar interferometry, which eventually led, uh, in the last few months, to the commissioning of the gravity instrument at the BLTI uh, interferometer in Chile. And uh, um, these uh, uh, devices are very compact and can deliver a superb performance in terms of uh, uh, visibility measurement. And um, even recently in, uh, in terms of sensitivity. So uh, another uh, active field in the uh, astrophotonics is uh, uh, maybe in, in the, um, probably the uh, um, development of optical vortex coronagraphs that uh, can achieve a very high nulling of the central star and uh, um, uh, allow the observation of very faint companions uh, at uh, uh, just uh, a, um, a distance from the central star 
which is in the order of the diffraction limit uh, of, um, of the telescope. Hmm? So uh, all these examples have been already tested on sky and have created a demonstration that potential for uh, in, in improvement of the instrumental performance. So uh, specifically um, uh, to what I'm doing in Potsdam, um, actually I'm, uh, I just started uh, working on this integrated astrophotonics group, uh, which is uh, um, uh, 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 the project uh, which will last for five years. And uh, 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 I have a, a six people stronger research group at InnoF spec, uh, so this is uh, a um, um, specific uh, a project uh, um, uh, at the University of Potsdam and uh, uh, Astrophysical Institute of Potsdam, uh, which Martin uh, described already uh, shortly this morning. And uh, within this uh, integrated astrophotonic umbrella, uh, we are aiming of uh, uh, understanding uh, application of and uh, developing um, application of photonics, uh, integrated optics actually, in uh, three branches. Um, basically, um, uh, one is uh, development of astro combat technologies based on uh, integrated optics. Uh, second is uh, uh, study uh, interferometric beam combiners uh, for uh, spectral interferometry uh, for um, the simultaneous combination of more than six telescopes. And uh, uh, the third one is uh, basically an assist uh, support. Uh, work package uh, to the other two, um, and uh, it's, uh, we are studying actually the interplay between uh, photonic technologies and uh, uh, our assisted uh, uh, adaptive optics actually to improve uh, um, the throughput of uh, astrophotonic components. So, uh, I'm sorry, in, the, in what follows, I, I, I give you more details about this uh, uh, because. Uh, um, um, actually, this uh, can uh, uh, can lead actually to some composition at the end. Uh, this, uh, these two fields, and we start with astrocomps. So the goal of this uh, integrated astrocomp research line is uh, to develop a compact uh, frequency stabilized optical comp for source, which uh, aims uh, primarily to calibration of uh, mid to high resolution near infrared spectrographs with a resolution of about twenty thousand and. Uh, uh, we aim at, uh, uh, through uh, some uh, stabilization scheme, uh, which is known as uh, um, uh, 2F, 2F interferometer uh, uh, technique, uh, basically to stabilize the frequency of the individual uh, comb lines of, uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of the comb um, uh, with an accuracy uh, stability of at least a 10 to minus 10, uh, which is limited basically to, to the precision of the atomic clock that you couple to this uh, control system. And uh, the heart of the instrument uh, will be uh, to miniaturize uh, as much as possible of this uh, setup, uh, which is also already commercially available, um, um, but uh, with the quite uh, extended and complicated, uh, um, mostly bulk optic uh, setup, and uh, actually to concentrate on uh, micro optics uh, systems like these uh, microarray resonators, which have a footprint of a few um, thousand uh, square microns. Okay, so um, this, uh, um, uh, yeah. Uh, so the goal will be uh, on two levels. First of all, demonstrate uh, this uh, uh, possibility to make a compact device uh, through this integrated optic technology, and the second and very important is uh, uh, to stabilize everything uh, within uh, uh, this uh, precision limit, which corresponds to approximately a few centimeters per second um, radi in radial velocities. So uh, this, uh, uh, this work package uh, basically extends uh, the inner specs experience in the last uh, five years, which led uh, to, the, uh, first of all, the uh, building up of a uh, fiber frequency comp source uh, uh, we, and which was uh, recently tested at Calaralto. And uh, uh, of course, this uh, uh, setup has many advantages, uh, and uh, one of them is that it addresses uh, mainly low resolution spectrographs, uh, which is a niche of application. Uh, however, for uh, the current uh, implementation, 
And here is uh, where this extension can improve actually previous uh, already excellent results is uh, uh, to control actually the long-term stability of uh, um, uh, the, the line positioning, um, um, taking advantage of the new uh, know-how uh, which will be developed on stabilization technology uh, for this kind of sources. So the second uh, um, uh, technology development uh, uh, goal uh, would be to uh, develop integrated inter interplanetic beam combiners uh, which allows uh, combi simultaneous combination of at least uh, six apertures and can be a, um, a a super pupil in a single dish telescope or a many telescope in a, a long baseline array. And uh, this is based on a concept uh, which I developed uh, in my uh, past experience at the University of Vienna, uh, which is based on uh, regular arrays of planetary uh, um, coupled uh, waveguides. And uh, this concept is known as discrete beam combiner. Hmm? So this the advantage of uh, being very easily scalable to an arbitrary large number of telescopes uh, in principle. And um, okay, there are many technological issues behind to uh, achieve a high level of performance, uh, which would be the core of the uh, research at uh, um, the integrated astrophotonic group. So eventually, the long-term goal is to deliver uh, perhaps a, a spectrum interferometric instrument which is basically can be interpreted as a um, high resolution version of integral field spectroscopy uh, instruments, uh, which can work either at the sub arc second uh, uh, resolution uh, by restoring actually the uh, full resolution of uh, uh, single dish telescopes through pupil remapping technique, or at the milli arc second level uh, using a long baseline. Uh, aperture synthesis with many different telescopes. Um, so an example here, uh, so interferometrists uh, uh, recently were able to achieve these data cubes uh, <coughs> uh, that uh, uh, also cosmologists have used uh, to, to work with, or uh, people working in galactic archaeology. Um, so uh, uh, the difference is mainly that uh, you can achieve uh, uh, a much higher um, um, single pixel resolution, and here you see the scales. Um, the field of view of the system is in the order of a uh, few ten, a uh, couple of ten milli arc second, and the resolution element is in the order of um, uh, one or two milli arc second, depending on the conditions. So, um, and towards the uh, conclusion, so. Uh, um, ideas about the possible instrumentation on sky test of this technology, which so the, basic, uh, the, the main focus of the research group will be developing basic technology, but the idea is also uh, within this uh, uh, five year time, um, time frame to be able actually at least uh, to, to do a few uh, on sky tests uh, um, uh, from one side uh, um, delivering a, a near infrared uh, uh, stabilized frequency comb. Uh, that could be engineered after, let's say, 2019 and possible on sky test in this period, 2022 to 2021, or uh, uh, to test uh, just uh, uh, simple uh, viability, for instance, interferometry of these interferometric beam combiners, um, perhaps uh, on a very short scale, uh, um, reusing some components which are already available for R band uh, and uh, three aperture combiner. Maybe even on a single dish telescope would be easy. Um, let's say in the time horizon beyond 2018, and uh, or a more developed instrument that could be used also to do science uh, could be a near infrared uh, pupil remapping interferometer based on the DOMA concept, uh, which uh, I proposed uh, together with other collaborators um, back in 2012. This could be tested also in the uh, sky in the time window between beyond 2020. So potential science cases uh, that comes up, of course, uh, uh, higher resolution spectroscopy is very important for exoplanet uh, uh, tiring science, uh, detection of uh, uh, Earth twins around uh, orbiting uh, um, perhaps, uh, uh, cool stars, cold stars. Uh, this has been, we have all seen the success of detecting a, a not like planet uh, or <laughs> potentially Earth like planet around. Uh, uh, Proxima Centauri, uh, and uh, um, yeah, uh, the, the, you see the radial velocity here 
is in the order of few, uh, oscillation is in the order of few, of about 10 uh, centimeter per second. And uh, so, um, oh no, score, sorry, uh, one meter per second, I think. Um, yeah, this is uh, basically a kilometer per hour. <laughs> so we have to make it a translation. Yeah, that's, that's, that's about one meter per second in the order. So uh, in a near infrared calibrate to a three uh, centimeters per second level will uh, be certainly welcome for this kind of science. Uh, the other part could be a uh, pupil remapping interferometer on a format uh, meter class telescope, for instance, could uh, um, do um, maybe um, uh, synthesize, can be used to synthesize direct uh, imaging of planetary systems uh, with um, um, or systems with low mass companions, uh, more probably, um, because it can deliver high contrast at, uh, and restore the uh, diffraction limit resolution of the full telescope. Um, companion separation for this kind of uh, should be at least uh, 40 million per second. So conclusions, um, photonics uh, um, has demonstrated already in the past decades that can, uh, can be used to enhance uh, productivity and performance of uh, um, uh, instruments and offer also the possibility to develop, uh, um, to reduce the size and mass of the instruments. Um, so this group, uh, my group at uh, the uh, InnoF spec uh, will in the coming year is committed to advance actually on the uh, miniaturized components uh, for uh, stabilized frequency pumps and multi-aperture interferometry combiners. And we aim actually uh, to on-sky test of new technology potentially within five years. And uh, uh, okay, we are really looking for telescope time and for partners. Thank you for your attention. This talk is, again, something slightly different. Uh, I look at one motivator, actually, we had today already a couple of commands that it would be nice to have a little more than the 5000 resolution, which seems to be the, the standard which we have in mind. Uh, what would be, it would be interesting to go for something which is 10,000, 12,000, maybe up to 20,000, besides from the obvious stellar cases. So, that doesn't work, okay. Good. Um, just as a motivator, look at the simulation for galactic winds. In that case, it's a Z equals three galaxy, but the not important thing. We have seen that all the time. That this hydro simulation, you have strong star formation here, and over time, you drive material gas out of the galaxy in a galactic wind. If you look at the velocity field, then you see something interesting. Uh, we have the disk of the galaxy here, you have now the filaments of high density and you have the regions of low density. And if you look at the velocity, and the velocity is here coded as the local sound speed, so you have areas up to 10 times the local sound speed in the areas of relatively low density. That means also this velocity, this gas, is of low surface brightness. So, if you want to look at the real speed, the real velocity field of a galactic wind, then you have to find this high velocity gas. The problem is, well, nature is more complicated than the simulations normally. Well, we have here an HST image, and it looks a little bit like that, what I've shown you before. And this is a famous low metallicity uh, a uh, star-bursting galaxy, you have a lot of individual winds uh, or individual shells and structures in surface brightness from well, something which is nicely visible, something which is faint at the limit of the resolution. So, mapping of wind needs high sensitivity, but it needs also high spectral resolution. Why? Well, if you look at a typical 
H2, a large H2 region, these are data from NGC 604 and M33, then the full width set maximum of your line and the intensity is strongly correlated. The high velocity gas is the gas which is faint. Again, the same as we have seen in the simulation, you find that also in observation. So if you want to look at the high speed, the gas which is really uh, going out of the galaxy, you have to find this gas. Well, that is a trick or a problem if you do that in low resolution spectrographs. This was an experiment we did on the local galaxy NGC 55, which is a nice global starburst, and we had a lot of high dispersion, long slits uh, going over this galaxy. And I just show you the structure. You see here the edge alpha line, and you see well, the rotation of the galaxy, but you see also these faint features here, which are outflowing structures out of the main disk. So if you now play with different resolutions and we use this resolution which has 20,000, about 20,000, this is the shell gram here. So you have the spatial axis here, you have the velocity axis here, and well, you have this faint gas out here. If you now play with this data and smooth them and keep the signal to noise about the same level, then at 7,000, you lose already a number of these structures. This one is still visible, but a lot of these fainter features here are gone. And if you go through 4,200, they are mostly gone, except for this very bright feature. This is a natural effect because you have your line, and if you have low resolution, then this line, the broadness of this main bright line, is dominated by your spectrograph. That means your faint high-speed um, uh, gas is hidden in the wing of this broad, well, broadened line due to the uh, spectroscope uh, resolution. So, you can play that with a different case. Here is sparse spec and hydra, so you have two dimensional uh, um, um, integral field spectrograph, and you have the case here R9000, well, and you can deblend the individual line if you have in abstract resolution, but okay, still at 9000 here, no, this is probably one Gaussian. And this Gaussian you can see, but only if you have really high signal to noise. But this is an easy case, but here it gets difficult and here it gets very difficult. If you go to lower spectral resolution, this is M82, the GMOS from a different uh, work, R4000. Well, and then you need really high signal to noise and you have to believe in your understanding of the line spread function to do this kind of deconvolutions. And really high velocity gas is sitting here in the wing of the line. Well, this is low resolution. You also see here the two nitrogen lines. These are not H alpha, the two forbidden nitrogen lines. And something here is hard to see. OK. That means it would be nice to have high resolution spectrographs to look for high velocity gas. Well, there are only few realize, well, dense pack and flame pack at the Mr. Hydra bench mounted spectrograph at the wind telescope and flames giraffe at VLT. The problem is both of these instrumental setups is throughput. They are not very efficient. Well, we saw that there is progress. We had the Megara talk by Amanda. And there are probably alternatives. For example, integral uh, um, uh, imaging Fourier transform spectrographs, as we uh, heard this morning. And there's also the possibility of using faber perot Okay, just a short reminder, faber perot you have just two parallel plates and you have interference at that and you get this ring structure and if you map uh, intensity and phase you can uh, derive a 2D <coughs> velocity field of the line just looking at the intensity of this ring moving out. But while you scan the faber perot change the difference between the lines or change the gas in between. So you can do science with that. Uh, and that's an example which I did with Michel Marcelin. Here you have an HST image in background, and here in color the velocity field of this uh, structure. And you clearly see that we have some deviant velocities here, which hint at an outflow out of this galaxy. <coughs> well, the resolution is not great compared to HST, but still you map out the gas and you see that you have not a simple velocity field. Okay, you can do something with that, but there are problems. Well, obviously, there's a really large field of view. You have good spectral sampling, and you can have 
high re spectral resolution easy, but you have problems too. There's a non Gaussian line spread function. Well, you can manage that. We saw that in even worse white line spread functions, or at least more complex line spread functions for the ITF. They are prone to reflection ghost. Well, okay, that limits your um, uh, so field of view a little bit, but also manageable. But the real problem is if you go to high spectral resolution, that means that, and this is the typical structure of the um, throughput of the instrument. You have here the transmission, you have wavelengths, and this is done for an infrared. But anyway, if you go for high spectral resolution, that means you get make these peaks narrower, then that means also that these peaks move together. That means the, spectral, uh, the free spectral range goes down if your spectral resolution goes up. And that is a real limiting factor. If you want to go to 20,000, then you have just 400 kilometers or less. Okay, so is that an option for um, Carla Alto? Well, on the short term, maybe. The Faber Piro, Marseille Faber Piro, is a visitor instrument. It's designed as a traveling instrument. There is an adapter at the 3.5, uh, for the 3.5 already available, and an adapter for the 2.2 would straightforward to build. The whole thing, it was used at 2 and 4 meter class telescopes before, so weight is not a big problem here. But there are problems, okay. There would be only a few blocks per year possible since it's a visitor object. There's some lack of compatibility with the current mode of observing that was, a, when we looked first into that, that was a problem and it requires additional discussions with the owner of the instrument. Okay, just a feel what you can get. This is H-alpha image of NGC uh, 3079. And you have here the field of view which you get at the 3.5 and that is the approximate field of view you would have with the setup um, at uh, the 2.2. If you get the sensitivity, you, have, you probably see, well, or probably not, that it's not only the galaxy in H alpha here, but you have also very faint large scale filaments, several arc minutes, several uh, 10 kiloparsecs kind of more coming out of the galaxy. So this is nice for local galaxies, but we have the problem with the free spectral range. What is the other possibility? Well, can we use instrumentation which is already at Kala Alto and push that a little bit. Well, higher spectral resolution, well, why not look at PPAC and PMAS? Well, the problem is higher resolution gratings will not work and smaller fibers produce a throughput operation. Thanks for Martin for pointing that out. There, that means you won't need a completely new spectrograph. Probably having in mind something like going for 15,000 or so, it may be possible with first order Creating spectrograph, maybe you have to go to a shell. If you want to go to a shell, then you have again a problem with a small <coughs> spectral range because you just take one order um, as the free spectral range and probably select that with an interference field. But we can look what uh, PPEX and PMAS give us already. Okay, there is a possibility. There's possibility one. There isn't 112 to um, lines per millimeter grating, second order setting that contains H alpha, and that gives you something like 16,000 on 20,000, depending if you have PPAC or the lens array. The problem is, I don't know of a setup I uh, ever try um, to go there. How good is the sensitivity? Because you are in second order setting, and it's the last of the settings in the set, so you are in the um, uh, and per range of the spectral half group. So you can do it and it excludes, this last setting includes H alpha out to 1500 kilometers, so local galaxies, it would work. But, and that was the point which I was making, maybe we should have a bright object, bright emission line object, maybe a um, planetary nebula to test the throughput in this mode. That would be interesting to see that if it is good enough, then we could immediately go. Okay, just the feel what you get. It would be again 3079, and you see the famous HST bubble here, which came in the enigmatic image. But the galactic wind is not only that, that would be one uh, PPAC pointing. Sorry, I had not the hexagon handy, so I have to approximate that with uh, the circle. But if you really look at the galactic wind of this galaxy, then you have to pick up all this phenomenon. So you have to map out this galaxy with many uh, settings. If it works, that would be a nice application for going that because we have something like 16,000 and that is exactly the region where you are in the area where you get the high velocity gas. 
There's another possibility, which could be done immediately, use the same grating, but in first order, and beyond 850 nanometers, the resolution is about 9,000 with the lens array. Unfortunately, only 6,000 with the PPEG. So, and you are really far in the red. So the question is now, have you a fitting line for that? Fortunately, yes. The sulfur three lines here at 9,060 and 9,500 are pretty bright lines, especially at low metallicity objects. Not as bright as edge alpha, but still significantly brighter than all the passion lines uh, in this spectral range. So that may work. And how would that look like? Well, for the PPAC, well, he would have would not be really happy with the spectral resolution. With the LAR for this very local dwarf starburst galaxy, which actually is one of this helium uh, two uh, narrow emitters, which we are currently looking at, you see the galactic winner, you could map that with four pointings of the 16 by 16 arc seconds and have the 9000 resolution. And if you go back to our friend before, then one pointing would be enough. So it would be a sample if you would look at um, around uh, that distance. So you have lower spectral, uh, the spatial resolution, but still you would have a chance to detect the faint emission when you see that in velocity. So if you don't want to build a new spectrograph, which could be an option a few years back, if you could play with 9000 and really look at the kinematics of the galactic wind, not that what we are, have done before, then well, it could be look at a few uh, dwarf starbursts, preferential metal poor, make this link to the high redshift galaxies with the uh, lens array in the uh, silicon 3 line. Or think of the 10, for example, the 10 nearest starbursts and use PPEG and the H alpha line, provided that this route would uh, test is successful. I just made a very narrow science case here, but the important point is if you go to this high resolution, it has a number of additional possibilities. Circumstellar nebula also play a PN kinematics, this is relatively low velocity expansions. So it means you need high resolution to see line splits um, around massive stars, around low mass stars. Cool supergiant diagnostics, these lines in the red are very important for the cool supergiant uh, um, uh, diagnostics. You can live with 5,000, but you gain in, sensitivity, uh, in accuracy a lot if you go a factor of two or three beyond that or jets of young stars, PN kinematics, and chemistry of very faint lines. There's this side effect. If you have very faint lines, then spectral resolution helps you. Well, you spread the uh, spectrum longer. If you have a very narrow line, then you collect less background. So that means at high spectral resolution, if you have enough photons, you are more sensitive than lower spectral resolution for these very faint lines. Okay, and with that point, I close and we are all on the way for lunch. <laughs>
and, and come back to you to ask you to find mm -hmm. the number. The second point is that you could think of uh, reviving an experiment that we did maybe 10 years ago uh, upon an idea that was created many years ago in Marseille, and we maybe to combine the setup of PIMAS, which was having very long four objects, as people told me, that it has a nice pupil that is accessible. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, placed a public parole inside to combine uh, the IQ uh -huh. with you now a finer uh, sampling uh, in the right -back direction, uh, okay. thus uh, with maybe 10 steps to subsample the, the original manuscript. So then they reached the, uh, the uh, spectral diffusion accordingly. Uh, it turned out that for the purpose of our experiment, it's also targeting emission lines, mm -hmm. namely uh, recombination lines in planetary entity. The, the calibration was quite a bit of a challenge, and we didn't have the resources to follow up. If you're interested, mm -hmm. please. Yeah. Okay, but for the calibrate, what, you mean the, the flux or the, the wavelength calibration? Wavelength and the flux. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, wavelength calibration, obviously, your, your group is developing the, the laser comps. So that's yeah, something which we should reduction. Yeah, that reduction. Yeah, that reduction. Independence of wavelength. Ah, okay. I see. I see. I see. So it's, re it's really mapping over the field. Okay. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Well, we propose for this for this evening a tapas session <laughs> in downtown. So uh, I think you received an email from Ana Guijarro. So just contact her. Uh, is there? Contact her for paying is uh, 15 euros, and we'll meet at uh, 7:30 here at the IAA and just go together by walk. And okay. Uh, I think it's enough. So uh, lunch is on your own in the book. You have a selection of uh, bars and restaurants close to the institute where. You